Hi, my name is Jonathan Houston. I'm the editor of Pinball Magazine. Today I bring you a story about three Dutch guys, a magic girl and a lot of labor to turn a pinball machine that was deemed dead on arrival into something wonderful. To appreciate this story completely, I have to tell you a little bit about pinball history. Early 90s and mid 90s, Williams Pinball was dominating the coin-op amusement pinball industry with their pinball machines. One of their pinball designers was John Popperduick, who designed games like World Cup Soccer, Theater of Magic, Tales of the Arabian Nights, and Circus Voltaire. By the end of 1999, Williams Pinball decided to close down their pinball division and focus on slot machines. Popperduick was out of work, and in the next 10 years, pinball machines became much more collectible. Prices went up, as did the status of these former pinball designers. In 2011, John Popperduick announced he would be returning to the pinball scene, designing a full-featured arcade-sized pinball machine called Magic Girl. He sold 25 of the games in a limited edition run for $16,000. Eventually, John ran out of pre-order money, developing the games but not being able to take them into production. So, everybody mad, nobody got their game, what you gonna do? Some people sued, and then American Pinball, a newly found pinball company, stepped up. They hired Papa Jewick to design their first pinball machine called Houdini, and in return they would be contract manufacturing the 25 owed Magic Girl pinball machines. Here we have one. When the game was eventually delivered, mid-2017, it turned out to be barely playable. You can plunge a ball, you can flip it around, score some points, and that's about it. None of the modes in the game are working. None of the mechs in the game are working properly, and some are even missing. Enter Eric, Roger, and Max. Three Dutch guys with a vision to turn Magic Girl into a fully functional pinball machine. And here's how they did it. I'm uh, Roger from the Netherlands and um, I'm uh, crazy about uh, pinball. My name is Max Rockmans. Uh, I'm a pinball collector and the designs by uh, John Papadiouk are uh, in my favorites. My name is Eric. Uh, I'm a pinball repairman for more than 45 years. Introduced to the world of pinball when I was a young guy. And since then, I'm uh, repairing those machines. My source for pinballs uh, uh, was a company in the south of Holland. And uh, the owner of that company introduced me to Eric as a uh, reputable uh, repair man for pinballs. And then uh, Eric said, uh, your pinballs are looking nice. Uh, I know a guy who can restore pinballs to a level you haven't seen before. And that's how I got to know Roger. The story about the Magic Girl for me is um, in, back in 2013. I was visiting a uh, shop and there was a, a flyer uh, on the door which said uh, New Pinball Magic Girl from John Papadiouk and that inspired me. And a uh, few, few years later, um, I was first getting in touch with, uh, with a guy uh, in the Netherlands who had uh, bought an, uh, a Magic Girl. Roger ta talked about Magic Girl and I didn't know what it was. I had no idea. I told him, maybe you need to see the pin because you like other pins from the designer. And I think you will enjoy watching this pin. And then uh, we visited his friend in the south who had a very nice collection. And at the end of uh, our visit there, he uh, took us uh, to his garage where he had some more games. And there in the corner uh, stood 
the, the magic girl. It was very nice to see. Uh, it was beautiful. It was love at first sight. And I will never forget that moment because uh, Roger really got emotional when he saw that pin. And that, that struck me. For me, that was, uh, that was the moment I got very excited about uh, this pinball machine. Although it wasn't working correctly, but it was beautiful. Roger was trying to get me interested in uh, starting a project to, uh, to get this uh, game back to working, but actually I wasn't too interested because I knew that uh, the game had been out for several years and nobody had any success in uh, getting it playing. And uh, therefore, before I wanted to make any commitment to uh, Roger, um, I wanted Eric to see the game. Uh, the Magic Girl, no, I, I, I never heard about it. I never saw it until uh, Max and Roger introduced me to it. With the question, is it doable to make it, to let it make work? I was very skeptical because if a manufacturer is bringing out a pinball machine and it doesn't work, I was thinking that it couldn't be that easy to fix it. It couldn't be a, a, just a, a plug in some cables and then the problem is solved. So I knew in front that there would be more problems that you can ever imagine. It's a, it's a kind of a contrast. If you see the game the first time, you think, well, this is a complete pinball. Uh, but then once you start playing it, the longer you look at it, the more, the more items, the more functions uh, are failing. And as we were there, we tried to play a game. And at that point, I saw that it was impossible for a quick fix. But the machine was so beautiful that whatever happened, we had to try it, because the machine deserves it. To me, the first impression was, this is different. This is absolutely different from what I've ever seen in the whole industry of games. And the translight is by far uh, the most beautiful translight I've ever seen. Magic Girl is just a prototype pinball machine. It wasn't it wasn't from the factory working. And then uh, I asked Roger, well, to what level of ambition do you want to go with regards to pinballs? And uh, I told him I want to, uh, to make this Magic Girl work correctly. And then he said, well, it would be a dream come true to try to fix a pinball like the Magic Girl. So I said, yeah, let's, let's try it. Yeah, let's take it on. We started the list of problems. We, we also tried to find solutions at every problem. We make the three, four, five solution. Uh, and, uh, and after that, we choose uh, the best one. Yeah, so, so uh, mostly Eric and me uh, together uh, thought uh, things through about how to, uh, to manage uh, all the problems. I gave them uh, relative freedom. I said when you uh, come to a conclusion and you both agree, then I, I agree with you. You don't have to consult me. Only if they didn't agree on uh, a direction for a solution, then I got involved. So the most important thing of a pinball machine is the input, the switches. If you have no start button, then a game wouldn't start. So you have to check all the inputs. And that, at that point, we saw immediately that at least 12 switches were not installed. So at that moment I became very enthusiastic because if you install those switches then the program detects a ball at a place that he has never seen before and that was our first goal, putting the switches at the places where it belongs. Yeah, uh, in detail Eric uh, tried to make the, the solution uh, perfect. When we started the project of uh, getting the game to work we all agreed that we should 
choose solutions that were natural, that could have been uh, John's uh, choice as well. We didn't want to drill any holes in the play field. Uh, we wanted to work with what was there. One of the things we directly noticed was if you activate one switch, the whole switch matrix test was lighting up like a Christmas tree. And at that point we found out that uh, diodes were soldered the wrong way around, wires at the wrong place of the switch. We started to adjust those failures and at that moment the switch matrix became stable. So we found more and more problems at the moment as we took on with repairing it. it, it became, the list became longer and longer. I'm very proud of the team, of what we have achieved all together. Every team member was essential in what we have reached today. And I feel like we're writing a little bit pinball history. And how nice is that as a pinball collector, if you can say that? First we want to start is to discuss is the skill shot. The skill shot is designed to get the ball in this exit of the, the skill. The second skill is if the, one of the letters is red and at the exact moment that the ball goes through the skill and then the lamp is red, then you get five times the score. So you have a double skill, very special. Uh, the original design was a reflective opto. Because it was mounted with uh, adhesive tape, it fell off, it was terrible design. So what we did is we made a bigger PCB, so it can be uh, mounted firmly with screws and not with adhesive tape. And also you detect that the skill shot is not made directly, so the animation can go quicker. So we now we get a new ball, new skill is going to start, and I'm going to put it in this one, and now I have a skill for 50,000. Ball comes out, if I let it drain, I have the second option, the auto shooter, also working. Next thing I want to talk about is uh, the Magna safe. The Magna safe is the opposite of uh, the Jinx. You have the Jinx and the Jinx. The Jinx is the turning table that's going to try to get the ball out of the drain or just pull it into the drain. And on the other side you have the Magna safe, uh, copied from Black Knight 2000, where you can push the button and it will save the ball from draining. Uh, in the original design there was no indication if it was active, active for you as player or not. You have to do some things in the playfield, then the, now the yellow light goes on, then you know you have a Magna safe. And if you push the red flipper button on the side of the cabinet, it can be activated. I'm going to show you. One of the things with the original design is that the ball wouldn't go steady. It kept on twiggling, wiggling, wobbling, and then it would go out of the drain and not be saved. And now it's saved. The next thing I want to discuss is the spinning disc on the left of the drains. Uh, normally it would only turn clockwise and uh, you have to be lucky when the ball doesn't drain. On the other side the ball just did drain. It, every time it took the ball to the drain and you lose the ball. So what we did was uh, thinking about how can we, could we make a skill out of it. Fortunately we had on the left side of the cabinet an extra flipper button that had no function. There were no wiring, there was nothing attached to it. So what I did was uh, making a PCB that you can uh, turn the disc from clockwise to anti-clockwise whenever you want it. So when the jinx is activated in the game and you think you're going to lose the ball, you press the red button in time and then the disc goes the other way, hoping that your ball doesn't drain. The next thing I wanted to tell you about is the hair jet. It's a virtual pop bumper mounted in the play field and it didn't work. First of all we saw that there was no magnet installed. Most easy thing, just install a magnet. But that gave problems. It began to smoke. It was not really 
uh, configured in the software, it started to smoke and it was not functional. So first you had to change that item. And after we have changed that, we mounted an, a new magnet so the jet could work. The detection of the ball was originally by a spring underneath. But the spring also influences the ball direction when it is not activated. So we took out of this, that spring. And now if the ball is in the area and one of the targets or switches is registering the ball and it, the hair jet, jet has to be uh, activated, then it would work. We also installed some lights because there were no lights in it, so you couldn't see it if it was working or not, and the light made it possible. I'm going to take the ball here, I'm going to activate the hair jet, then the lights will go on and it's going to flash. Two, one, zero. And now if I throw the ball to the middle, oh, it's going to take the ball out of it, oh, this path and it goes the other way. Next item is the hex targets and the lion saw. There was some strange thing going on because originally there were three targets, hex, the H, the E and the X, but the H was gone. Instead of that position they had a Newton ball for the Newton ball behind it, for the Newton ball uh, multiball. So what we did was combine those two, dus de Newton ball is also now the, the age of the hex uh, targets. One of the things also is mounted on top of it is a lion saw, similar as the tiger saw of the Theater of Magic. And also did, this one didn't work, it didn't turn. So we couldn't uh, leave it that way, so that's why we made it uh, turning by adding a little motor. And I can show it by taking the X, the E, and then the ball to the Newton ball, and now it turns, it spins a little bit. So that was the lion saw, and of course the H is also the Newton ball, is also the Newton multiball. I have to hit it several times to get the word Newton. There's one, four, three, two, one, and now I have Newton multiple ready. Shoot the chamber to start. I'm going to shoot it in the chamber. And now we have Newton multiball. And every time I hit the H, I get a jackpot. Next problem we found was uh, a really strange one. The potion spinner only registers if you have a 360 turn degrees turn. That was too difficult. And the other one was the potion hole, who is in fact a vertical upkicker. The problem was it was uh, so strongly that it would shut the ball onto the glass and in its path it would find the potion spinner in its way and those potion spinner are all broken now. So what we now did was ex to add some extra uh, movement for the potion spinner, so now it detects more by five uh, times for 100, 360 degrees, sorry. And if you have potion complete, you can see it in the screen. Also this target, complete it, you go to the hole, and now it drops out smoothly. Hop. And it won't demolish your plastic sets anymore. Next thing I want to show is the locks and the multiball. Uh, multiball is accomplished by locking two balls, one in the left and one in the right ramp, and the third one in the air magnet. First you have to do is get the lock light on. With our adjustment we have said the first lock is given away, and the second one you have to make by the letters L-O-C-K here, in the out lanes and in lanes. So the first ball I can lock in the first ramp, just letting it in by hand. And now the hand goes down and is locking the ball. I'm going to do it on the other side also. The screen is showing lock ball one. So if I have, I have the letters lock already on. If I can shoot it up here and it goes in this ramp, the hand goes down and it holds the ball again. 
And now I can lock the third ball and I can do it here in the air magnet by shooting it upwards. And now you have multi-ball start. And then the balls come out from the left, from the right and from the middle. And now we have a free ball multi-ball and now you can shoot your jackpots. We also have a ball safe on the, on the multi-ball. If it drains within 5 seconds or adjusted 10 seconds, you get the balls back to have more game. One of the things you can notice on this uh, machine is of course the locks. Originally they had a blue LED under it, underneath those hands. Those hands were just mounted on the ramps, didn't do anything. And now it can go up and down, activated by a coil, by the lock coil. And if you lock a ball, I can do it now, then the light of the LED will become green to tell you that the ball is locked. If it's releasing the locks, it will be turned red to, to uh, give you a notice from, okay, be careful, the balls are coming out. So I can do it a second time, lock in on the other side, and then I get the third ball. And if I lock it also in one of the ramps, no problem. It will turn red and it's going to re release the balls. Now you have a ball safe on the multi-ball because he wants to give you enough time to play. Uh, one of the things needed also for a multi-ball is the ramp diverter. Originally it was, was mounted on top of the ramp and that was uh, taking you the view on the screen because it was prominent here in, in, in the view of the screen. So we now, and it was not working. The ball would always go straight through it because the movement was too low, it was too weak. So now we put it underneath this uh, ramp and now it's activated as a gate wire with the spring. Now you have also more view to the screen. Uh, one of the last things I want to explain is the mini play field. Uh, there was a lot of discussion on the internet. What does it do? How does it work? How do you get on it? But in fact it was not so easy. It has a history. Originally it was a hole. Like the NBA fast break, you had a hole with two coils. One to kick it up and one to kick it sideways. And a switch of course. But they decided to do it other ways. The software was uh, waiting for a switch and now they mounted just an iron core and nothing else. The meaning of that iron core was the magnet underneath had to fetch the ball like you do in a Circus Voltaire at a wow target. The ball is in the, in the area, it is detected, the magnet is going to catch or fetch the ball and then it would shoot up to the air magnet. I'm going to demonstrate it. First we have to uh, enter the king's chamber several times, then the diamond lamps are going on. This is one, two, and after the fourth time you have 25 seconds to get the ball onto the magnet. Okay, like this. Now it goes to the air magnet and now it's going to drop down between the two magna flippers. And now you can flip, just like the twilight zone. I'm not so a very good player, I'm more a mechanic. But the goal is like in the twilight zone to get the ball from the mini play field to exit at the rear. And if you exit at the rear, it's going through a small iron ramp to the magic mirror it will be detected and it says battlefield defeated, nothing more, nothing less. For completing the game for the end game, you don't have to succeed in the mini play field, but you have to get on it several times. Just a hint. One other thing I almost forgot is the levitating magnet. The levitating magnet uh, was designed with a target behind it. The purpose was that the ball would roll underneath hit the target and at the moment that the ball was rolling back to the flippers the air magnet would suck the ball out of the play field into the magnet. Uh, I, we saw that it wasn't possible. I think even on an earlier stage with development they also saw that it was not possible. That's why in all the games 
The target is not mounted anymore at the back, but in an angle of 45 degrees underneath the magnet. Like a, and then it can bounce upwards. But bouncing a ball upwards needs a very firm contact. And every contact of target is yeah, uh, moving, so the ball wouldn't go up. So that's why we decided to make a little ramp, a ball guide, that the ball could go upwards. And now you could see that the ball goes to the top. After several times, it has to fetch the ball and it going floating into the magnet. So three times it comes out on the top and rolls back. And the fourth time it holds the ball. It's going to show you in the screen one more to start levitate. And now it's levitating. <laughs>